So it's my great pleasure to introduce, uh, privilege to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ms. Dr. Lauren Culver, uh, who's an energy specialist at the World Bank. She's also, pleasingly, an alumni of our group in MSD, working with Jim Sweeney and me and a few other people. Uh, and five and a half years ago, was sitting exactly where you are, and she's now working at the World Bank, working on energy transition scenarios for, or pathways, I should say, for uh, developing countries in, in a big way, which you'll hear about. There are two things I'd like to uh, add to her impressive bio that you already have. Uh, one is before she came back to graduate school, after she had two masters at MIT, she decided she would need, she could use a real education. So she had been working at the State Department and as, as such was one of the uh, specialists at the State Department on how to diversify uh, energy supplies in the Ukraine away from dependence on Russian, I want to say Soviet, uh, oil and gas. And number two, kind of a neat tie-in showing we have continuity in the um, seminar series. Uh, when she was at MIT, one of the master's students she recruited in to the program she was in was Sarah Carney, who we heard from two weeks ago, which I should have guessed but uh, didn't. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren, who's a energy specialist at the World Bank and much more. Thank you. Uh, John, thanks so much for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here with all of you. As John said, I am a senior energy specialist at the, at the World Bank. I've been working the last couple of years uh, with African, uh, Southern African and Western African countries on a variety of different issues. And recently I've joined uh, an energy modeling team uh, within the World Bank. And we are helping advise countries on uh, how to use energy modeling to think about uh, their development and climate goals and how to achieve them. Um, and as John said um, previously at, this, at the State Department working on energy diplomacy um, and at the US Department of Energy working on energy technologies uh, and innovation. And I'm not speaking on behalf of any of those organizations today. I'm speaking more in my private capacity as uh, an engineer that works on the policy uh, space um, and energy and is quite excited about it. So what I really wanted to share uh, with you all today is just um, some perspectives on uh, the energy transition in developing economies um, and particularly what that might mean for, for climate finance. Um, I imagine many of you are familiar with uh, that's that's right. Um, with familiar with the uh, 100 billion dollar pledge that was made uh, at the COP15 uh, in Copenhagen back in 2009, uh, and what was hoped for uh, was that advanced economies would mobilize 100 billion dollars each year uh, for developing economies to help uh, help them finance the transition um, from a mitigation and an adaptation perspective. You may also know that uh, so far. And rather than $100 billion a year since 2020, only $90 billion has been mobilized in total. And so what, uh, as we're going into COP27 in Egypt uh, next week, uh, the G20 in Indonesia the following week, I really wanted to just uh, kind of scope out for you um, different ways to think about whether this $100 billion is the right number. Um, is that what needs to be raised? Um, should you be concerned that it hasn't been mobilized yet or you know, is there still time? And if that money were to be mobilized, uh, how, how should we think about using it? Um, so with that, I just want to start uh, with the basics and we'll build from there. I'm sure as all of you know, uh, the best science really comes from the International, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change about the need to reduce emissions globally uh, by mid-century in order to uh, avoid the worst effects of climate change. Um, and as the energy sector is 75% of global emissions, um, the IEA and others are thinking about what does specifically that goal mean for uh, reducing emissions in the energy sector. The IEA came out with this report last year um, looking at um, reducing emissions to uh, net zero by, by 2050. Uh, and the net and net zero is important because there's some expectation that negative emission technologies uh, direct carbon uh, removal will be beneficial. But you can see uh, the IEA is not very bullish on that technology as a solution. And what that uh, means is somehow we're going to actually reduce emissions. And unfortunately, despite the fact that um, historical cumulative emissions um, are mostly in the rich uh, and developed world, 
uh, as you can see in the chart on the right, reducing emissions only by the top emitters isn't sufficient to reduce emissions to what's required um, by mid-century. Uh, and so uh, whether we like it or not, what that means is that all countries will be needing to reduce emissions um, in the coming decades um, if the globe is going to meet uh, these emission targets. And that's really a challenge um, for uh, low-income countries to think about how to meet their development goals um, uh, in an affordable way. And what I want to talk about first is one of the, these challenges, one of the reasons behind this challenge, is really a story about demand growth. Um, so this is uh, just showing you the difference between uh, energy demand in 2020 and 2050 in different regions of the, of the world. And what you can see is in the advanced economies, uh, energy consumption is predicted to decline, um, whereas in the developing world, we're seeing emissions, uh, uh, energy use increase. And this is really driven by two factors. It probably won't be a surprise. Uh, one is electricity or energy access, providing access to people uh, that don't have modern energy today, uh, and also economic growth. So I'll say a little bit about both of these things. Um, first, energy access. Uh, today, 733 million people lack even basic access to uh, electricity, and 2.4 billion lack access to clean cooking. Um, globally, we've been making a lot of progress on reducing uh, these numbers in the last uh, couple of years. But for the first time since 2014, we've actually seen these deficits grow um, in the last year, so we're moving in the wrong direction. Um, and if you look at current population growth rates and our ability to expand access right now, um, unfortunately we're on track by 2030 when we should be reaching universal access to both electricity and clean cooking, still having 600 mil million people without access to electricity and 2.1 billion people that still lack access to clean cooking. Um, the investment that would be needed to turn this around is uh, $35 billion a year between now and 2030 and $25 billion a year between now uh, and 2030. So for, cooking, for, for electricity and for cooking, which may seem like really big numbers, but I think as this conversation progresses, you'll see that this is really a rounding error um, in the volumes of capital that need to be moved uh, for the energy transition. So it's just kind of imperative that the international community decides, continues to commit to the fact that this needs to be a priority, um, despite the fact that other capital is being mobilized for, uh, for energy transition. Um, the, uh, the other thing that's um, unfortunate about this analysis and the analysis that you saw before is that the definition of energy access that we use here, what we're considering a success, um, is 50 to 100 kilowatt hours per person per day, um, which is really a, a paltry amount of, of electricity. Um, this graph is uh, some work that's been done by the Energy for Growth Hub. On the x-axis, you have gross national income per capita, and on the y-axis, electric power consumption. And what you can see from their work is if you look at what 50 kilowatt hours per day or 1,000 kilowatt hours per person per day translates to into um, wealth, we're looking at something much less than even a dollar a day. Um, and so even though achieving electricity access, um, energy access is important and essential for human well-being, um, it is absolutely not the goal line, cannot be the goal line for um, economic development and progress. But what that means is even more energy consumption um, that would need to uh, be delivered in the developing world um, to be able to, to turn this story around. So certainly energy demand is a unique challenge that the developing world is facing that feels a little bit different than what you see in advanced economies. The other issue is really an issue about affordability. We'll look at affordability in three ways, um, starting with fiscal affordability. So fiscal space um, means different things to different people, uh, but basically it's the ability of a government to use its budget uh, to to do things, to invest in education, to invest in health, to invest in roads, um, to invest in anything else. Um, and that can be limited by not only the investment goals of the country, but also by uh, debt service. So to the extent that countries are borrowing um, to be able to invest in their economies um, every month or on a regular basis, they are paying um, the cost of capital for what they've borrowed. Um, and what we see is that uh, debt High debt is a really big problem and a growing problem um, in the developing world. 60% of low-income countries are in debt distress or near debt distress, and 30% of middle-income countries are in that position. 
um, and this is a number that's been that's been rising over time. And so um, that's kind of what's shown in the first figure here. And the in the second one, uh, you can kind of see uh, the difference between what's happening in advanced economies and emerging economies as it relates to the public budget to advance clean energy transition and to support affordability. So this is actually work the IEA just published last week, had to snag it. Um, and what you can see is that in advanced economies, uh, they're not only spending more in absolute terms um, to advance the energy transition and to make sure that energy is affordable for its citizens, um, but even in GDP terms, um, they are spending far, far more than uh, emerging economies can, can afford to pay. So it's obviously uh, not that uh, emerging economies aren't willing or wanting to be able to make these investments, but they're unable, uh, unable to do so because of the competition for the limited resources that they do have from, from their budgets. Um, in addition to fiscal affordability, so the ability of the government to be able to pay for energy transition, there's also a huge consumer affordability issue um, in emerging markets. Um, and we think about this in a couple of different ways, depending on who the consumer is. Um, so one thing the World Bank uh, collects data on is looking at um, household energy poverty. So the metric we use is that um, if energy costs 10% or more um, of a household's expenditure on a monthly regular basis, um, then we consider that, that uh, household to be in energy poverty. And so we collect information that looks at um, how much of a population can afford um, a, a given type of energy. And this data is actually just a snapshot looking from the multi-tier framework. Um, and this is looking at in, for the lowest quintile um, of a population, so the poorest 20% of a population, whether they're even able to, avoid, avoid, to afford, um, and by that I mean less than 10% of their income, in this case 5% because it's just looking at electricity, um, of... Uh, um, how much that they can afford um, from their from their budgets um, to to be able to get electricity. The other um, aspect of affordability from a consumer standpoint is from the industrial side. And when we think about industrial uh, consumer affordability, it's it's really a competitiveness issue. And you can imagine that this is extremely important for energy intensive industries and whether they're able to compete. Um, in a global or regional kind of market and selling their goods and services. Um, and this is work, again, by the Energy for Growth Hub that I like um, because it looks at not only what's the cost of electricity, but um, in these countries where the electricity is not reliable, uh, industries have to turn to have backup diesel generation available for them. So basically what they do is a simple weighted average cost of, um, of electricity, looking at what does electricity cost when it's available, and what is the cost of the diesel substitute when the grid is not available um, to be able to compute what they call a reliability adjusted cost of electricity. And what you can see here is absolutely enormous uh, electricity costs. I know many of you may not look at your electric bills, but I can guarantee you, you are not paying anything um, even close, uh, close to that for, uh, for the electricity that you use. Um, a third aspect of uh, affordability that I think is important to consider is really the affordability for the utility. So utilities play a really important role uh, in energy transition and being able to borrow to build network infrastructure, either to do VRE integration um, or to expand access to the grid. Um, they are primarily the off-taker for electricity and PPAs or the private sector. Um, and so they really need to have sound financials um, to be able to play this role in the, in, uh, in the economy and in the energy transition. Um, but unfortunately, what we see is that many, many utilities across the developing world um, are not financially viable. This is some work that the World Bank did um, that's looking specifically at African utilities. And 40% of African utilities um, don't recover enough uh, revenue to even make, meet their operating and debt service costs. Um, and if you take out the subsidies that some utilities get um, from the public budget to try and make ends meet, um, it's actually only 20%, 25% of utilities that actually uh, make enough money to cover their operating uh, costs, much less uh, capital costs and other things that you, you might normally want um, for a business. So again, just another challenge that the developing world is facing um, when thinking about how to uh, afford the, the energy transition.
Um, if all of that feels like bad news, <laughs> um, the, the bit of good news uh, is what's, what we've seen in clean energy technology costs. And this, I think, is a story that's probably well known um, to everyone in this room. Uh, a decade ago, uh, what we were all hoping for was the day when uh, renewable energy technologies would be cost competitive uh, with fossil alternatives. And what you see here is in that past decade, um, renewable energy costs have, uh, levelized costs have dropped dramatically into this band, which is kind of what's representing the cost of fossil alternatives. Um, and this is truly great news. Um, this means that uh, you can make an economic decision that in the long run you are saving money, you're spending the least amount of money to deliver uh, electricity by choosing a clean option instead of a fossil option. Uh, so this is something to celebrate. Um, however, when we look at what's happening um, in investment trends um, around the world, uh, we don't see that, uh, that good news really being reflected. And, and this is something that we want to think about why that's happening. So in advanced economies, we do see uh, that as renewable energy has gotten to be cheaper and cheaper, there's an expansion in the investment that's made. We see a similar story uh, in China, where there are large investments um, in these technologies and that they are growing over time. You will see that in the uh, developing economies, that is just uh, not the case. Um, not only is it not the case today, um, but the gap that we need to overcome because of the demand story I told earlier, um, means that we'll need much, much larger volumes, higher multiples of what is mobilized today if we're going to meet the challenge of energy transition um, in the coming decades. So this information is actually just looking out till 2030, uh, where um, uh, what we see that developing countries need four to seven, to mobilize four to seven times more money on average um, than they are today. And what is also interesting in connecting to the point of fiscal affordability that I made before is that if we look at this number, it's a much higher fraction of GDP um, than it is in, in advanced economies um, where the scale up is not as large and the impact on uh, their economies will be, will be smaller. Um, and so to just try and unpack and understand why, why is this happening? Why is it that we see uh, levelized costs of electricity that are so low, and yet um, in markets um, we don't see that investment. And there are a lot of reasons, but what I would like to argue is the primary reason um, can be found when you look at the capital structure of these renewable energy technologies. So this is a table that I've just reproduced from the IEA's um, World Energy Outlook. It's from 2021. I didn't update it last week when the new one came out. So if you forgive me on that one. Um, this is data from India. And what you can just see here is for a couple of generation technologies, coal, gas, solar, and wind, um, you can see the capital costs, the capacity factors, um, fuel, CO2, uh, and operating costs. And we use all those numbers, as you I'm sure well know, uh, to calculate levelized costs of electricity. And so what we see, just like we did on the graph before, um, these renewable energy technologies on a levelized basis are cheaper um, than their fossil alternatives. What I've done is add the last column, which is showing you, it's just simple math of the first two columns. If we just uh, divide the capital cost by the capacity factor, you get a better representation of how much upfront is investment is needed, um, factoring in the availability of different technologies, um, obviously different lower fa capacity factors for renewables. And here all of a sudden, so maybe we'll stick to the PV uh, and gas comparison, Rather than PV being the clear winner over gas, you see here that the upfront capital costs um, for uh, PV are more than twice as large as they would be uh, for, a, uh, for a gas plant. Um, and which just means if you were to go to the store and try and buy one, you, you would need more upfront money. Um, and what's important to think about and uh, we'll move on to is um, sometimes when, especially for poor households and for poor countries, um, you aren't trying to minimize your lifetime costs. You're more interested in, in minimizing your monthly costs. You're living on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis, and that's how you have to make the decisions that you're making about which options to choose. So before we come back to that, the, the other element to bring into this mix um, are the weighted average costs of capital. So uh, in uh, the developed world, 
This is for a PV project in 2021. So these numbers have probably gone up a little bit uh, in the last year because of uh, interest rates and uh, the impact of that. But um, w what we see is low, uh, low cost, weighted average cost of capital uh, in the developed world. And you see much higher costs um, in just these snapshots of the developing world. There are countries not on this list where those numbers are are even higher um, for a variety of reasons that account for country risk, the sectoral risk, and, and specific project risk. So what we see is when we see um, these interest or these cost of capitals that, that are two to three times higher, um, that's affecting then um, the, the overall cost of, of uh, doing these projects. Um, as I'm sure you all you know, well know, uh, these, the actual kind of financial models that you would build to make these comparisons are quite complicated and very bespoke for an individual project in this specific area. But in the end of the day, it kind of works like a house mortgage or a loan for a car and that you um, go and you, uh, you know, are able to borrow at a certain rate and every month you pay down the principal for your house, for your car, for your power plant, and you pay something in the, the interest cost, the cost of capital um, over time. And so if this interest rate is high, your monthly payments um, are going to be high as well. I think that's something that you probably are all well familiar with just from your own personal finance. Uh, the second figure, I just a uh, point I wanna make is not only is there diversity of these uh, weighted average costs of capital between countries, but this is something that changes over time. Um, and this is actually a positive story in this case. In India, uh, we saw much higher weighted average cost of capital when the solar industry was new there, um, when there was a lot of uncertainties um, in how the process would work um, and how results were happening. But as that um, market was able to demonstrate success, you saw investor confidence rise and the risk premium that they demanded lower and therefore the weighted average cost of capital come down, which, which fundamentally impacts the, the cost of these projects. So this is just a little thought experiment, um, back of the envelope calculation uh, that I wanna walk you through just to marry these two concepts together. So if you can hypothetically imagine uh, a country needs, um, needs some, some new energy uh, and they have an alternative to weigh between doing a solar PV project or a gas project. So if you can imagine a, a thousand megawatts of one gigawatt coal plant or gas plant, um, you need about one LNG tanker every month um, to run a CGT, CCGT plant um, at about an 80% capacity factor to provide energy. If you want an equivalent amount of energy, but you want to deliver it with solar PV, you need many multiples of installed capacity. So it's six gigawatts of capacity that you would need. Uh, to be able um, to provide a similar amount of, of energy. So if we um, think about uh, with this graph, we think about again, what's the monthly cost that it's going to be? Uh, we can really simplify this problem in the fact that um, for a PV project, what's really driving the monthly cost is going to be the cost of capital times the total amount of capital costs that you have. And what you can see here is that low, low cost of capital means uh, low monthly cost for, for that um, investment, high cost of capital, high cost, that's the, the yellow line. Um, alternatively, if we look at this gas project, uh, really the, the monthly cost of that gas project is going to come down to uh, the cost of your fuel. That's really gonna drive um, the overall economics. So if uh, a few years ago, 2019, you went to the spot market to, to get an LNG tanker, you could possibly contract around $5 in MMBTU um, of gas. And if that's the case, you need a very low cost of capital on that solar um, to make that solar plant more uh, uh, ch cheaper for you on a monthly basis um, than, than the um, alternative. And if you're in the US uh, or in other developed countries, you probably can get that cost of capital. But in most of the developing world, it's probably not, not an option. If we go up to uh, instead of buying on the spot market, if you wanted to hedge and get a long-term contract, a couple years ago, you probably could have done that for about $10 uh, an MMBTU uh, for gas in that tanker. And then you can see how the cost of capital starts to make a difference. 
if you're getting cost of capital around 6%, like China, um, PV project still looks good. If you're getting cost of capital like 11%, 12%, like South Africa, um, you're starting to rethink uh, whether or not this project is going to work. Uh, and this is really just a basic demonstration. I haven't done anything to change the long-run economics. These probably could both be very economic projects. Um, the PV may be economic and more economic in the long run um, in all of these scenarios. But the point is not all countries have the luxury of choosing uh, what to do for their energy supply based on long-run economics. They're forced to decide um, based on what they can afford today at, at this moment. And that's really driving um, a lot of countries um, away from, uh, from high capital cost uh, technologies when there's a high cost or a high cost of capital. Um, this is just a classic poverty trap. It happens in countries the same way it happens in households. Um, it's just a, a common thing where you're living, you're making your decisions based on kind of another metric. Um, there's another darker side of this that I'm sure many of you may have anticipated in looking in this graph, and that's the issue of, of volatility. So if you had uh, decided, hey, this $5 an MMBTU spot market price of gas, excellent deal. Let's just run with this. Um, it's our best option. Um, it might have been great for a few years, but when you hit the market this year, when we've seen $30, $40, $60 an MMBTU uh, for gas, that $200 million tanker that used to have pull up every month is now a $200 million tanker. And so you're faced with the choice um, of not funding uh, projects in health, in education, um, things that you probably wanted to have done over the last few years, um, or um, not buying the fuel at all and just having blackouts and rolling blackouts throughout the country. And that's a real, that's a, a real decision that many um, emerging markets uh, are facing um, when trying to decide how to secure their energy. So <laughs> I'll try and go to solutions and end on a, on a happier note. Um, uh, as I said, um, you know, these meetings that are coming up in the coming weeks, it's going to be a very big com topic of conversation of what is the role of different types of finance um, in really solving these issues. Um, because it is a finance issue that we're, that we're facing. What you're certain to hear over the coming weeks is the critical role for private sector investment. And that is absolutely true. The scale of finance that needs to be mobilized is absolutely enormous. Um, just for clean energy, so not for coal phase down, which we haven't talked about, or for mitigation or adaptation, or for reducing emissions in other sectors outside of energy. But just for the clean energy side, um, we estimate that it will cost $100 trillion, no, $1 trillion a year um, starting in 2030 uh, to, to be able to, to meet the investment needs. Um, and so the scale of it requires um, private capital to come in, but private capital at the interest rates that we've just looked at um, aren't going to be affordable uh, for, um, for these developing countries. And so there's a really important conversation that will be happening about the role of concessional finance. Concessional finance is um, any, it's kind of an umbrella term, it goes from grants, loans, through guarantees. Uh, the, the, the underlying idea is that money is provided um, at something more generous than commercial terms. Um, and usually it's done so because there is a longer term goal, um, a public goods goal um, that motivates um, the need for that. And, and affordability is certainly um, one of the things that is influenced. And so there's a discussion about what is the role, how do you use this concessional finance? It is inherently, it's always going to be limited in, in amount. There's not lots of it laying around everywhere because of the fact that it's um, offered at less than, than market rates. Um, so how should we be using it? And so some options are to uh, think about using it directly uh, as loans to bolster public budgets so that, that countries can invest in really critical infrastructure like transmission that can connect um, renewable generation projects or other things. Uh, and other options um, that are considered are maybe um, how to use very small amounts of concessional finance to try and change the risk perception um, around these projects uh, in different countries. And that's specifically to target the story that we looked at. How do we, how do we reduce these weighted average costs of capital um, to be able to make these technologies affordable? And so there's lots of options for how you might try and reduce risk at the country level 
um, at the sector level and even at the project level. Um, and so that can be planning, setting better government targets with really credible plans on how things can be um, implemented. Um, this can be improving policy frameworks. This could be strengthening institutions that are either doing the planning or doing the implementation. This is developing um, auctions and other market and pricing signals um, that can transparently communicate to the private sector what, um, what costs um, uh, to, what's the cost of these different technologies. Um, you can also use concessional finance in more targeted um, uh, risk mitigation instruments, financial tools um, that are able to shift who the risk um, of certain projects falls on um, so that the risk is uh, managed, is, in, uh, is, is given to the party that has the most opportunity to be able to manage that risk. So all of these are different ways to be spending that money. Uh, which kind of gets to one of the original questions I kind of posed of how do we, how do we spend this money? Um, I gave you a little bit of a hint on is $100 billion uh, enough a year? And if, if the bill just um, for the clean energy transition is a trillion dollars, uh, I'll let you answer whether or not that will be enough climate finance um, to, to really meet um, the development needs uh, and climate needs for these countries. Um, and then really is the, the, one of the other questions is, is money needed now? Is it a problem that this was supposed to be mobilized in 2020 and we still haven't gotten around to it? Uh, and I would just <laughs> argue that it, it takes time um, for reforms to take hold in a country, um, for this work to be done, um, and for investors' risk perceptions to change. And that's really what we need to do if we want to see um, these weighted average costs of capital uh, come down. So in my closing slides, I just want to bring this back to, to energy modeling, and I know there's a few of you out there, and this is uh, uh, my bread and butter work these days. Um, the World Bank uh, is one of many organizations that are now starting to think about how to use energy models to help uh, put emerging markets, uh, these economies, more in control um, over their investment decisions and how they can be contributing to development and climate impacts um, simultaneously. And this uh, last year, the World Bank uh, launched a new product called the Country Climate and Development Report. Uh, we're doing this for many countries, and we'll do it for all countries over the next five years and repeat them um, uh, every year after, after that. And this is just an example from the work that we've done in Turkey to give you an idea of how specifically the energy modeling can translate into, uh, into government plans and strategies. Um, so we do things like estimate um, what's the cost of investment that's needed um, just to meet the development goals of a country? And then what's the incremental cost that's needed to meet the development goals and also meet uh, the climate goals, um, just to give countries an understanding of that. Um, the other thing our work can do uh, is really to help inform uh, countries as they're coming up with just energy transition strategies. So unfortunately for time, we, we didn't get to talk about the other side of the energy transition, which is really the phase down of of fossil fuel assets across the economy, but especially in the power sector. And so some of our work uh, can, can give us some interesting information about um, what the value of stranded assets uh, will be in countries as assets are, are asked to be retired prematurely. Um, so this work in Turkey, we found, uh, we estimated that the cost of their coal stranded assets could be as, could be as much as $4 billion um, that will also need to be provided by some combination of public, private, um, and concessional finance, all working together as efficiently as possible. And you know, what's happening in Turkey is another issue that's uh, replicated across uh, emerging economies. 89% um, of stranded assets, the World Bank estimates, will be um, in developing economies. And that's because the uh, average economic life of a coal plant is about 40 years. Um, but uh, sixty percent of the coal fleet is less than twenty years old today, and those young plants are concentrated in in developing economies and so the burden of of stranded assets is really going to fall um, to to a few countries in the emerging markets. Um, the other thing we can kind of inform is uh, the just energy transition. how should countries be planning for um, budgeting for uh, the the management of uh, people. Um, communities, workers, and the land itself um, as coal plants and coal mines 
um, are retired uh, and new opportunities are, are presented. So uh, the, as I said, the World Bank is only one institution that's thinking about how to bring um, climate and development together within the modeling sphere and, and to think about this as we inform um, national and international strategies. So the last thing I want to end on is just some interesting work that the uh, Energy for Growth Hub again uh, released recently an interesting paper that's asking the question, who should be involved um, in making these decisions about um, climate uh, and development and using these models? And they just, um, they, they themselves come up with a similar re uh, recommendation that in order uh, to, um, to do this work well, we need to be thinking about development at the same time we're thinking about climate goals. Um, otherwise, it's un unlikely that maximizing one is going to result in the other one working out. And they also make another important point, point number five here, and that's about who's doing the work and whose perspectives are re really being brought into this. Um, and if you've done any energy modeling, you know that uh, models are always simplifications of the real world. Um, but what makes good energy modeling is making good simplifications, uh, the right simplifications, um, which really is informed by having people that have a really good understanding of the context of what can be simplified and what needs um, to be re represented explicitly. So all in there, I mean, that's their call um, to, to broaden the, the pool of people thinking about energy modeling. Um, but I think it can be applied more broadly um, that regardless of why you wandered into this room today and which discipline you're coming from or how interdisciplinary you feel, these are re really, really big challenges. Um, and people like me in energy at the nexus of climate and development, we can use all the help we can get and all the perspectives um, that we can um, to see this problem uh, in unique ways and, and to be able to see solutions. So. Thanks everybody for your attention and happy to take questions. Very timely talk and very thought provoking, I think. Let's see if we provoked any questions from the audience here. Um, why are utilities in developing nations having a hard time staying profitable or even breaking even? Great question. Um, there are many reasons, <laughs> uh, and they uh, intertwine and unfortunately feed off of each other into a, a pretty vicious spiral that can go down and down. Um, one issue uh, is typically the, I'll, I'll start the cycle in, uh, they have oftentimes a difficulty um, meeting load growth or being able to afford fuel, and so reliability of the electricity they provide uh, starts to decline. And then populations say, why am I paying for this electricity um, that I don't even know when it's coming and I can't count on it? And so you see collection rates um, for uh, electricity consumed go down. Um, when you see collection rates go down, the utility doesn't have money to be reinvest in operation or in kind of O&M for their system. So then you see technical losses um, in the distribution and transmission de grid decline. So then you see reliability decline even more, and I, I think you can see how the cycle goes on and on. What's particularly damaging, and I kind of alluded to this on the volatility uh, issue, is that um, you know lots of events can happen. The climate impacts, you can imagine how this will happen more and more, and countries are put in an emergency situation. Um, so it's very common for countries, there, there's these things called power ships. Literally a barge drives up to the port with a, just has a whole bunch of generators on it, but it usually runs on diesel. So extremely expensive um, fuel, also an extremely expensive, usually PPA, because you need it in an emergency and you're stuck in a hard place and so you're gonna pay for it. Um, and then if you're unable to pass those costs through to the consumer because of the affordability issue we said, and if the government that made you buy this power ship um, get into this contract, forced you to do it, but now doesn't have any money to help you make up that gap, um, you, you see these like just incremental step changes in the, in the financial viability of utilities as they're just kind of wedged and having costs go up and no way to increase revenue. So um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty vicious, vicious cycle. So the reason U.S. utilities don't have the same exposure <laughs> is it because just we have more capital so we can buffer the volatility more or just we have existing 
grid infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think there's a variety of reasons. Um, uh, one is we have, so the grid itself in this country, as you probably well know, was mostly publicly financed. I mean, the government built it all. It wasn't necessarily passed on to consumers. In the developing world, we're, we are adding those costs on to um, consumer bills in many cases. And so there's a little bit of the pace of development maybe isn't right or the way that we fund those things. Um, and so then, yes, cost of electricity can often be higher. People can't pay. And then uh, and the cycle continues that way. We don't really see um, that in this country. We're able to design rates uh, in a way that we can both ch deal with the affordability issues where they are um, and the competitive issues, but still, but still manage cost recovery. But if you've ever looked into the tariff process, um, it's, it's complicated even in this country. It's not that straightforward um, to make sure that you're achieving cost recovery and they're constantly tweaking and trying to think of better ways to do that. So it's not easy, um, but I think that's part, part of why it's possible in, in advanced economies. Um, one question I had was, I was slightly surprised by the chart towards the beginning that was looking at the short-term energy affordability as a percentage of GDP, uh, like the subsidies that they're providing in emerging markets versus advanced economies. Yeah. I was expecting that, that the um, in uh, lower income countries it was going to be actually higher, um, especially because there's a lot of conversation right now currently around like fuel subsidies. Um, both for you know transportation and then a lot around cooking, especially in, in Africa. Um, and so I'm curious if you could speak to a little bit more around that and then also how you know governments should be thinking about removing those fuel subsidies. Um, you know, I, I know in Kenya this past it was a big part of the election cycle um, and that the president had to sort of consider. So curious how you're thinking about that. Yeah, I think so um, I'll have to cop out a little on this, and that this is the IA's analysis and of their in their new report. Um, so I'm not exactly sure on their methodology of what they've included in here and what they haven't. But it's a free report, and you can you can read it just as well as I can. Um, but I had the same shock. I mean, I think the narrative is that it's developing countries whose governments are just spending left and right on on. Um, on uh, consumer affordability on subsidy issues and then that's not an issue here in the developed world and this data is obviously suggests the opposite we're perfectly comfortable um, willing and able um, in advanced economies to for public money to be used um, to put our finger on the scale of of the cost of electricity and what the mix of electricity will be it's it's not all just uh, a free-for-all um, but your point on fuel subsidies is, is an important one, and this is something that I, I think there's consensus uh, about, is that they're, it's <laughs> the way they're usually structured um, is not, uh, not helpful. Usually a fuel subsidy is um, applied directly to the product um, and not to the household, in a sense. And so what happens, the more of that you buy, the more gasoline, the more gas that you buy, um, the more subsidy, the more you're benefiting from a subsidy. But if you're the one buying a lot, you already were the p household that didn't need the subsidy. Um, so you're, in a sense, that type of subsidy application is benefiting the wrong people. So it's not that the government's instincts are wrong, that there are vulnerable parts of the population, poor parts of the population, that should, um, you know, should be accounted for in the structure. But the way they do it is, is uh, is a little bit sloppy. And so you can, you, there's a lot of literature out there about how do you target subsidies? Um, where do you, how do you calculate it? Where do you apply it um, as, so that it is helpful to the people that need it most, um, but is not um, prodigal to a level that, that governments can't afford to do it? And that it's not sending the wrong um, market signals about what the real costs of certain energies are. There were two questions. Oh, they're multiplying. Maybe I take them yeah. all at once. I don't know. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, I guess one question I have was, you showed a map at the very beginning of your presentation, um, and uh, basically showing like the decrease in demand um, in developed countries. I understand why demand will increase in developing countries, but I'm just also, is it a function like greater efficiency that demand is decreasing or, yeah? Thanks. Let me take a 
that one and then that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, you can um, just. Yeah, I mean, I just read papers on, uh, like, the structure of the loans and, like, the conceptual finance, if you call this, and how it, like, has really negative impacts on, like, health outcomes and poverty alleviation programs in various countries. So how do you justify, like, some of these, like, forcing these countries to cut programs, um, like, with your goals of saying, like, you want this to be equitable? Yeah. Thanks. Great question. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for being here. This has been highly informative. I had, actually, I have a bunch of them. I'll just restrict myself to one. Uh, so affordability, cost competitiveness, rising infrastructure, uh, upgradation of the grids, at least for the Indian subcontinent. All of these things are looking uh, as if there is a solution in the horizon. Eventually, there will be. The problem is also as much with the political will, uh, bureaucracies, that side of the story. So how does an international institution, uh, or in your opinion, how would one impact this political will of long-term solution versus a short-term non-solution impact sustainable uh, agenda? That one's harder. Glad it's last. Um, so uh, the question on uh, on demand. So yes, efficiency. Uh, what you would normally think of efficiency is included in this, um, but this is also all um, energy demand, not just electricity. And just a fact that as we move to electrification of things, um, it's more efficient. Um, it's just a more efficient. So that's a, a really those those negative numbers um, are largely driven by. Uh, the greater electrification that we will see um, in uh, the overall energy mix uh, um, in in the future. Your question on structural adjustment, uh, that's a, a really challenging uh, history of the World Bank and is honestly outside of my my lane of expertise. I'm more in the infrastructure infrastructure space than the kind of macro fiscal uh, bigger picture. Um, but certainly what your goal is thinking of is uh, how do we use this concessional finance without jeopardizing other uh, development objectives of the country? Um, and how do we achieve those development you know, objectives of the country? So personal opinion, um, I think one important thing is making sure the government is part of that conversation um, from the beginning, that they are um, thinking about that and we're giving the tools for them to think about climate and development simultaneously. Um, and then I think another issue, and, and this is really about um, how do we use concessional finance um, as little as possible to the greatest amount of leverage? And that's why so much thinking is going into this, because there's something about the energy sector um, where we can use private capital. Um, and that's more challenging in other sectors. I mean, you just don't see as much, um, even in, in advanced economies, you don't see as much um, private uh, funding for education um, or for health or for research. I mean, there's certain things that have a, a quality that's public about them. And so um, it's important to, to not pillage that money just for the energy transition. And with the limited pool of concessional capital, the only way to do that is to use that concessionality as targeted as you can um, to, the, to the biggest amount of impact. And that is exactly what all of the conversations will be about over the coming weeks, because people have different of, of opinions on what is the best way, um, how do you get the most bang for your buck. So it's not just about, we need more bucks, we do. Um, that, that's for sure, um, but also there's a responsibility, I think, of people in the space to be able to use this efficiently as possible and to be advising governments are borrowing for this money. Um, and so it's not, sometimes it's grants, sometimes it's free money, um, hopefully there'll be more of that, but governments are borrowing for this, so they also need to be assured that they're getting the most bang for for their back. Two minutes for the hard question. Two minutes for the hard question. Um, yeah, political will for long-term solutions. So we, um, the good news story on this um, is a lot of energy transition, not all, but we can go a long, long way, um, is economic in the long run. It is a better decision. Um, and so the, I think the hard work is how do we make that real for countries? I mean, how can we 
um, solve these finance issues so that clean energy actually is delivering more affordable, reliable energy so countries actually are freed from this volatility and this poverty trap that they're set in. Countries want this change. They want to be able to move forward in this way. They're just kind of prevented from doing so. And so I think um, a lot can be done if we solve these, these finance issues. Then stickier stuff comes. Eventually, things aren't necessarily more economic, and there will be you know, higher costs to different parts of the transition. Uh, people are thinking about that even now, but that's not necessarily my, my focus. So I, uh, yeah, it's hard to say when, when it gets really tight um, how we might think different. I think we'll think differently about it by then. Maybe you know, technology advancement will postpone when that hard conversation has to happen. Um, Hopefully, hopefully some people in this room are working on those issues. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I would say is um, there is so much that's good right now. How do we make that possible and have countries be able to experience those benefits of energy security and affordability that they could have um, if we're able to solve this finance issue? Great. With that said, uh, thanks to uh, Lauren for great answers to the great questions from our audience. Thanks. Thank you all.